Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 96 of The Effort Report. I'm Elizabeth Matsui. I'm here with Roger Pang, and we are going to talk about a variety of things, but the main thing we're going to focus on is revisiting the, the topic of travel. And that was inspired by, I guess, a conversation we had just a couple of days ago. Yes, while I was traveling. <laughs> while you were traveling while and about to, travel. Uh, about to travel. And I think also you were musing about, you know, applying some st- statistics to help with travel. We'll get there. But not really, though. But, but not really, yes. Yeah. Um, we have some follow-up, though, which uh, you're going to have to go through because I don't know what it is. Well, so remember when I called the Academes podcast our sister podcast? Uh, yes. W- without asking them. Without asking them. <laughs> okay. They uh, tweeted us and said that they accepted. Oh, okay. So you know, I saw that tweet, and they're like, and I didn't understand what they were talking about. <laughs> well, maybe they were. They didn't say exact. That's what I presume they were talking about. Oh, okay. I was like, what was our proposal? <laughs> Okay. All right. It's all it's all becoming clear now. Got it. So that's very exciting. Okay. Well, it's, is it like when you have like a sister city, you know, or something like that? I think it is. But what is what is that? What are the implications? I've never understood what that means. Don't you like accept a contingent from the other city or? I think I think plaques might be involved. Like we have to make a plaque. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well. Not sashes or meeting ribbons, but plaques. <laughs> no, I think that is, plaques are like the domain of sister cities and sister podcasts, I guess. Right, right. And they need to be displayed at the entrance to the city or the podcast. Or, or, or in some park, yeah. <laughs> yes. And then there's also the key to the city. Yeah, that's totally different, though. Is it? That's different than being sister cities? I think I guess. So, yeah. Okay. So we're not giving out a key to the podcast, anybody? No, you got to do a lot more to get the key. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hear that, Academes? <laughs> or every other podcast. <laughs> or every other podcast. <laughs> the bar for a key to our podcast is high. Yeah. So other small things. I, this occurred to me, this is just kind of a random thought, but I remember a few years ago, you half-jokingly said, oh, you know, the way you can get things into science and nature is just write a commentary. That's true. Well, that's easier said than done. But at the same time, that you pointed out that that was easier to get published in these kind of glamour journals doing that than actually trying to publish original research. <laughs> and that's based on my personal experience, not on any sort of systematic, you know, study. Right. And I tucked that comment away, and then just over the last few months, I think I wrote an editorial with you and others and a letter to the editor with you and others that were kind of similar types of pieces, and they felt so much easier. I mean, there's obviously less um, work behind them, and you could argue there's less substance in terms of like direct evidence you know you're not you're not doing a study you're there, there's no evidence there's no evidence well yeah. you cite evidence it's not like you're just sure yeah you're not creating p- pulling evidence. something out of the hat right to say you know statistics should go by the wayside of all <laughs> research or whatever uh-huh. i mean they're based on evidence but you're not creating the data yourself right and it was helpful for a couple of reasons. One, I, when you move someplace, I've had different estimates given to me, but people think on average you're, you take a quote-unquote two-year hit in your productivity. Okay. And so this is, these are ways that you can continue to keep your productivity up while you're kind of establishing the infrastructure at the new institution to actually start collecting your own data in that new location. Um, and so the timing of, of those pieces worked really well, and they and they were easy to write. <laughs> yeah, it's like a win win, right? I mean, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Now, now the problem is, is I don't have any primary data to publish to follow up on those pieces. Just write more commentaries. Do you think you could make an entire? It's and oh, I guess I'm all over the map here. But what I should also say is that. This is a path that's generally not open for more junior, early career people because the opportunities to get asked to write an editorial or to be able to 
knock on the door of a journal, you know, and ask the editors, oh, I'd like to write this commentary and have them say, oh, we would love that. You have to kind of have a reputation or you have to have a more senior person have that reputation and kind of bring you along for the ride. I think, yeah, in general, that's true. I think one thing that you can do is often to take advantage of a hot topic. Um, and uh, so if if there's a topic that's hot at the moment and you have something to say about it, and then I think your chances are, are higher. Uh, not dramatically higher, but higher. I mean, I think in, in the commentaries that I've written in the past, I wouldn't say I was like particularly famous, you know, <laughs> right? or, you know, relative to like people who publish in science and nature, you know, but I think you take advantage of a hot topic and you're, and you strike at the right moment, then, um, it can play to your advantage. How much effort do you recommend putting towards this? Or do you just kind of wait for opportunities to come up and it's more of like a side gig? That's a good question. I mean, I think that depends. I for me, it's kind of a side gig. I think I don't write that many of these, um, because, well, I don't know why. I just, I, <laughs> I, just, I just don't. I don't know why. You, um, you were you were just discussing one right before we started recording. That's true. You know, I think, and I think that's the kind of thing, though, where like if you like sometimes like these commentary pieces play a role, but in order to kind of like shape the discussion, um, in a certain field or subfield, right? And uh, and so if you want to do that, it can be a lot easier to do that than to say like, you know, do a research study which is going to be a lot harder and more time consuming and not really have the same, it may even have a less of a, less of an effect than, right. than writing a short commentary. Um, and so I think um, that's the way to go in order to kind of just kind of shape a certain discussion of a certain topic, but that's as far as it really goes, you know? And so I think it doesn't, it's not like a substitute for, you know, producing evidence. Right. Right. But I think as you get more senior, you know, you start just having more opinions. <laughs> <laughs> about things yeah they become more well developed and some might argue calcified <laughs> <laughs> and uh so the the I, so like the co- so the commentary style pieces they kind of roll off the tongue right because you've had so many years to express these opinions well um, and you've also not only years to express them but as you start talking among kind of your collab of friends the ideas get more and more refined right and typically they are things like you said, that are informed by a perspective about the direction of your field or reliance on certain types of methods, for example. And you, and it's hard to have, for me, I don't think I could have had that perspective or understood those things until, like, I needed to spend at least a certain amount of time trying to do the work in order to develop that kind of perspective and then refine an opinion that was informed by that perspective. Right. Yeah. I think, I think, I think the approach to these editorials and commentaries, I think should generally be opportunistic. Like, I feel like if there's something that you think is important and you have a clear thing that you already know you want to say, uh, then just, then, yeah, then go for it. Write it down and send it in. Um, I think if you, if it's like a topic that you think is important, but you don't really have a well-formulated idea yet, um, then I would say don't spend like a ton of time, working on it (laughs) i would say just let it go for now and maybe come back to it some other time um because i I think the i I don't think it's worth spending the same amount of time on a commentary as you would like on a research paper or something like that i i agree i mean it should be something that i mean the two pieces that we were authors on those ideas were fairly well formed i mean there was still some work that needed to be done to refine them right you know, so they, they, they came together pretty easily and quickly. Yeah. I mean, I think in the, similar for the other ones that I've written with other people. I mean, we just kind of like sat down and just, you know, scratched it out and then just typed it basically. That was, I mean, it, it was, it was, you know, it was on the order of hours, not days. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, oh, so some of these journals, they only let you write like 500 words or whatever. So it's not like right. you can spend a lot of time working on it. But anyway, that's my approach. So should we move on to pet peeves? I can't wait. You cannot wait. Yeah. Uh, Making things more complicated than they need to be. Okay. I I have to be careful about this one because you can – my other pet peeve is making things more simple than they (laughs) – 
<laughs> oh, this they is, need this to be is so perfect. No, you should have saved that for la- for next next time. <laughs> exactly, as I'm saying this, but there are certain scenarios, right? I'm, I'll focus on the making things more complicated than they need to be scenarios. Okay. Sometimes the viewpoint of people from certain fields. Actually, a good. Ex- a, do you do you think we have any lawyers that listen to this podcast? Uh, we'll find out. We'll find out. A good example is that a lawyer's job is often seen as risk mitigation, and so they don't want to pursue any path forward that involves any risk. I, I know that's more of an absolute statement than probably the reality is, but that's a different way of thinking about things than how can we make this happen with the least amount of risk? And the reason that the former scenario makes things more complicated is that if you enter into a meeting and you're trying to get from A to B and the tenor of the meeting is every single possible complication and so that the upshot of the meeting is why you can't get from A to B because every you know everyone keeps raising all of these issues then it makes sort of impossible to kind of get to a solution even when some of the issues that are raised there's a hierarchy of issues right there're like some issues that if you could solve that one issue the other stuff is totally feasible to deal with it might be a a pain or require some extra paperwork or hurdles, but that path you can see. And people then throw in all of those other things that are feasible to address in some form or fashion, you know, where there's like a pathway that's established, but it may be onerous, on top of the big problem that need that that is the make or break that's that is absolutely necessary to solve before you can even think about the other things. And so you can get into this meeting where there's this vicious, you're like in a vortex of all of the the different types of issues that range from logistical to conceptual to legal to, and regulatory, and it makes it very hard to actually make any progress. Well, I, I think it's funny that you say that there's a hierarchy of issues because I think that is true. The problem is that nobody agrees on what the hierarchy is, <laughs> right? Like everyone thinks their problem is problem number one, right? Well, but I think you can apply a conceptual framework. To let's say you have a lit, you know, you have people in the meeting and you come up with ten issues that are framed in terms of like, well, this is just going to make this not possible. You could probably go through each issue and say. Is there an established path for this? You know, yes or no. If there's not an established path, is there a a theoretical one that, you know, people feel comfortable would meet all the legal and regulatory concerns and, you know, be appropriate scientifically or whatever? And if all of the other things or that most of the things on the list you can answer yes to one of those two questions, but yet there's something else on the list where there's no pathway established and you're not even sure yet that there's a theoretical way to make this happen. Then you need to focus on that one thing to develop the theoretical way to make that happen and then you know try to execute it. And the other stuff, that'll come in, into play. And so I think you could create a framework. I'm not saying everyone will agree in the end. I noticed that you're speaking in the hypothetical right now. Yeah, I, you know, a friend <laughs> wants to know. No, I know. I, I say that just because it's, I don't. I, I take it you've never actually done this. <laughs> you've never actually like solved the problem in this way. Oh, I have. I have had that conversation not after a meeting has happened. With other, you know, with people who participated in the meeting, but I have not tried to do that in a meeting. And, and part of it, well, yes, there are practical reasons why I didn't, but I've not tried to make that happen. So you're ch- suggesting that it sounds all good in theory, but it's not going to get people to come to some consensus. Not in a meeting. Uh, I think the reason is because basically, if you do this in a meeting, you're saying, okay, you're not important, but th- you are important, is what you're saying. Like, 
you ha- you're depending on people to separate the people from the problem, right? And people aren't good at that. Because their egos are involved. I think it's more. I think it's more basic than that. I just think like if if you raise an issue and you say, and then someone else raises an issue, and then you, as the leader of the meeting, say, okay, well, your issue isn't really that relevant, and your issue, but your issue needs to be tackled. And what does that mean, right? What is that? You know, how do I interpret that? Yeah, I guess I. That's interesting that 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 is a viewpoint to consider because I, of course, have, I that never occurred to me because in my mind it's sort of like, look, I know. That person A's issue that we need to grapple with, and, and it's important to grapple with it, but we can't even get to it unless we first deal with person B's issue. And so I'm not saying that it's not important. I'm right. just saying. We're just not going to deal with it yet. Yes. Yeah. But I well, guess you I should can... try it out. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll report back. I'll be... I'll be looking for opportunities. So did any of that make any sense about making things more complicated than they need to be and getting sucked into this vortex of, I I think this happens sometimes in a more abstract way than I was describing because I was describing a scenario where I was trying to accomplish a, a complicated task kind of. Yeah. But I think this happens when you get a group of people together who there's an RFA that comes out and everyone's trying to brainstorm about what to propose. Yeah, I think yeah, that's a common occurrence early on because then everyone's coming up with like, oh, here's the here's the problem with doing this, and here's the problem with doing that, and it's a it's a, I think it's often a matter of uh, perspective. Do you have any tips for dealing with that? Well, <laughs> I think you actually suggested the tip, which is that you have to kind of deal with it outside the meeting, right? Uh huh. And that's the kind of thing where. I think when people say like decisions don't get made in meetings, that's kind of that's like what they're referring to. I think right. It's because when you're in the meeting, I think human behavior is, little, is different than outside the meeting. The meeting's like a public forum. Right. Yes. I don't know. That's not like the most useful advice, but <laughs> the problem is if you have a large group of people, you can't be like <laughs> managing each single person like you know individually. Right. Well, I certainly sort of start to like have that ugh feeling when there's a meeting about an issue and then someone chimes in and they say, oh, we need to bring in so-and-so from regulatory. And then someone else chimes in and says, oh, we need to bring the lawyer in from contracting. And then someone else. (laughs) Yeah. And then you just know that that the whole meeting is, I guess it would be useful to sort of at least air all of the different issues. But beyond that, I think my attitude towards this, though, has evolved over time, uh, and it's, and I think I've come to the realization that some complicated issues are just complicated, and and to get them get things done, you just have to kind of someone has to just ram it through basically, <laughs> and meet with all the people that need to be met with, and and right. bring it to a resolution, and. Uh, um, it's just the way that complex organizations work, I think. Right. And then the person who's sort of just ramming it through and making it happen is the person who really their task is to simplify the unnecessary complexity to make it happen. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is like a, is a negotiation, right? So like making sure that people, ha- you know, they're, you know, it's, uh, are satisfied with whatever agreement comes out at the end, you know? And so it's, it's a negotiation. Have you ever been the person that's had to quote unquote ram it through? No, I've always failed as that person. <laughs> that's why I don't get anything done around here. <laughs> Have you attempted that before? Uh, I've been involved in situations like that, and I think, um, and they've always just kind of like you know fallen flat. Basically, I've never achieved anything particularly complicated or large scale. Well, I'm not suggesting these things are like like it's not like I'm going to create a healthcare system for the state <laughs> of Texas or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's sl- slightly smaller scale than that. Yeah, just a little. Yeah. The other solution, so to speak, uh, for that is to is to actually is to develop relationships with the with the various people involved. Because I think the hardest time is like when you're trying something new, and you actually don't know any of the people who are going to get involved, like the compliance people or the legal people or whatever. Like you, if you don't know any of them and they don't know you, then it's like that's like I think that's like the you know, worst case scenario in some sense, right? Right. Uh, and then over time, I think if you do this more often, you, you develop relationships with the, you know, the council's office or with the, 
you know, the risk officer or whatever, and you know those people and they know you and they trust you and whatever, then I think those things can, then you can know, well, I'll, you know, I'll talk to so-and-so later because, you know, you know, I know them and we'll, we'll talk about the risk issue or whatever, you know, and I think those things, you can kind of like grease the skids a little bit when you have relationships with these people. That's something that just kind of happens over time. Right. Do you think that um, you had an appreciation for that maybe right after you joined the faculty? The importance of that. No, yeah. I, no appreciate. I, I think I, so the one thing I can remember is, you know, at some point, not in the very beginning of my career, but like, you know, at when we had some kind of intellectual property type, you know, issues. And I had never talked to anyone in the university about those, about these kinds of topics. And I didn't even know who were the people to talk to. And then, you know, we were meeting them for the first time and they didn't know who we were. You know, it was like, and, you know, those, that, that kind of uh, sequence of events, t- it takes forever, you know. Uh, cause it's very formal in some sense. Right. And it's like, you have to set up meeting after meeting after meeting. Um, uh, and so, but then like the next time it happened, like we all knew each other. <laughs> right. So like, <laughs> it was like a separate thing later on that happened again, relating to intellectual property. And it was like, Oh, well we all knew each other. So we just kind of emailed back and forth and it was like, yeah, it's fine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, you know, and then it all it comes down to it, I think is that you build, you know, a certain amount of trust with various people at the you know at the university who are in these key positions and then they don't have to worry about you anymore. Right. No, that's a good point. And and I, I asked you that question because I, I did not have an appreciation of how helpful that could be, you know, the development of relationships. It, for whatever it is that you you are interested in doing. Yeah, and I think there's an attitude often in the beginning of your career, which is that like, you know, these people, the people who work at the university, like they're supposed to help you, right? Aren't they supposed to help you? Right. Right. I think there are two issues. There's one that that's the case. Right. And then the second issue is related to kind of, well, my reputation and my work should speak for itself. Yeah. I think that's separate. Yeah. Yes. And so if you're trying to accomplish something, and you email someone whose job supposedly is to help out faculty, not only are you thinking it's their job to be immediately responsive, but you're also thinking, well, you know, this is a really important contract to pursue because obviously, you know, I got a lot of institutional press, you know, recently about this finding and how I was going to pursue drug development or something. And so, the person I'm emailing should know and should know that, you know, what I do is important. And one of the things that's annoying but probably unavoidable uh, is that, you know, people kind of come and go, right? Like naturally. <laughs> and so, like, you may spend time developing a relationship with someone and then they move on and then there's, like, a new person there. It's like, uh, <laughs> you know, you're kind of stuck. But um, there's not a whole lot you can do about that as a faculty member. Right, right. Well, there may be other people in that office, though, who know of you. Yeah. And so people, that's the other thing. It's like you can email someone who just seems like a name and they're sitting in the dean's office or the provost's office. You don't really know them. Well, they're at, they're actually, they're real people and they work in a group usually. And they, you know, whoever they are serving, that population or audience they're serving develops a reputation. And they talk amongst themselves. Actually, this is related to a topic I think we discussed a while ago about in terms of navigating the institutional kind of, uh, what's the word, an institutional structure, you know, like uh-huh. in terms of who does what at the institution. And, um, and I think part, sometimes problems like, you know, the complexity of certain kinds of problems can be solved by knowing like, oh, if I go to so-and-so, they will resolve these four issues all at once, basically. You know, and uh, but if you don't know if you don't know that, <laughs> then you might have to deal with each issue separately. And contact one or two people per issue before you find the person right. who exactly, yeah. But of course, if you don't know that person, if you, even if you know of that person, if you don't know them, then it's kind of hard to be like, hey, can you deal with these four things for me? Right, you know? right. So did you? I, so what are the things we're? Gonna I, do? I didn't do my homework. You did not I, do your I, I homework. Didn't. No, I'm very bad. So we we'll touch on this briefly because we have a big chunk, I think, of uh, different things to talk about with travel. But there was a paper that came out in the press around it, or I don't know whether it was press or social media buzz was um, that 
this paper came out and the authors were trying to determine whether it's the environment that a faculty member is in that drives product, their productivity or whether there's something else about that person's training or that is inherently different about the person. So does the environment of the institution matter? And the observation was is there are these institutions that are very prestigious and they're known for you know, publishing a lot of very high-profile papers. And is that because they select really talented people or is it because um, two people, you know, given having given that they have the same degree of talent, and they didn't use the word talent, but say background and and productivity in the past, but they get selected into different environments. They get jobs in different institutions, one more prestigious and the other less prestigious. Does being in the more prestigious environment, even though you have the same background and preparation as someone else, does that, is it the environment that helps boost your career? Did, I don't know if I explained that very well, but did, did you follow what I was saying? So I didn't really do my homework. I apologize. Well, I can give a, I can give a little bit more detail background. But. <laughs> but I think so maybe, but maybe before we go into the paper itself, uh, I think it might be useful to say kind of a priori, like what do you think would be true? Um, uh, so I think the environment matters a lot because I think sometimes there's a tendency to think, oh, that Roger Pang, he must be brilliant because he's at Hopkins at the number one school of public health, where, you know, there are brilliant people at other institutions that are not whatever the number one institution or department in whatever field. And that they're actually very talented people everywhere. And there are people who um, are at very prestigious institutions who are not necessarily any more inherently talented than people at other institutions. But given being at that institution, they tend to have their careers take off and and I think it happens in multiple ways, and it happens. Uh, and this paper is going to refute this first thing that I'm going to say. So their evidence suggests this is not the case, but the expectations may be different at a more prestigious institution um, in terms of like what your peers are doing in terms of their productivity and and their impact or their prominence. Um, the other thing that happens is that. Their various departments know they become sort of this incredibly well-oiled machine at supporting early career faculties, uh, you know, career trajectories. And there are, you know, great examples back at Hopkins of departments that are like machines at getting people K awards. And they just know how to do right. it. They have a recipe and... It just doesn't mean that it's automatic or it takes a lot of work, but uh, that it doesn't take a lot of work, but they know how to do it and they know how to make it happen. And when you're in that environment, all of that is laid out. That path is just provided for you. You're not having to figure it out. You don't have mentors who are trying to figure it out who haven't done it before or have limited experience. And then um, the third thing that there is typically – like Hopkins as a biomedical institution is enormous. And so there's more direct access to people who cross a range of expertise. Um, and so those sorts of interactions, I think, are helpful. So in other words, if you're, to be more concrete about it, you're writing uh, your career development award or some other grant and you are a laboratory-based researcher and you realize it would be a major strength in order to kind of demonstrate some evidence that what you're studying in an animal model is applicable to humans, it's not hard to find somebody at one of these large prestigious institutions who does human-related work that where they either have samples banked or they're willing to collaborate with you, et cetera. And so that resource, that institutional resource, 
can be helpful in terms of shaping the strength of the science that's proposed. Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely I agree with all of that. I think the hypothetical experiment that you'd like to do is to take, you know, like me and then take my identical carbon copy twin and send them off to different universities, right? Right. Um, one to, you know, I don't know, Johns Hopkins and one to somewhere maybe less prestigious and see what happens, right? I think, you know, my identical twin has at some other university has just less of a chance at whatever these me- the metrics they use in terms of like productivity and prominence. Right. For this um, paper, just to be clear, you're talking about the metrics yeah. in this paper. Yeah. yeah, in this paper, right. Yeah. I think, you know, the environment is has a huge impact, especially early in your career, just in terms of the everything that you said. And, um, you know, one thing that made me think of is, you know, like when they, uh, in if you want to be like a, you know, like a screenwriter for like movies and TV, you know, they say, you know, you got to live in Los Angeles, right? Because <laughs> uh, that's where every, that's where so many things are. The environment there is all connected. Um, and it's not like it's impossible to do that somewhere in some other city. Um, is, but it's just harder, you know? Right. But, but I th- think that one point you made is actually a really important one is that if you are, um, whatever, Steven Spielberg, you can go move to, you know, a town of, a thousand people, you know, way away from Los Angeles or New York or whatever, and establish an environment there and be much more likely to be successful. So that the environment matters most earlier in your career and then and starts to matter less and less. I think it still matters. And then you may get to a point in your career where there's an opportunity to try to create that environment someplace else. Well, I, there's a bit of a semantic issue here because it's like, you know, I think if you're wondering, you know, what it matters to for like, say, prominence. So it's, well, if you're already prominent, then then nothing matters. Right. right? I mean, so um, anyway, that's just a but that's just a wording issue, I think. Um, so but I think, yeah, but focusing on early career kind of faculty and seeing and how, you know, what what are the ter- determinants of kind of like their prominence or productivity? Uh, I would imagine the environment plays a huge role. Um, it just without, without having, you haven't read the paper. Without having read the paper. Well, the paper <laughs> yeah. like confirmed my, you know, it was confirmation bias for me. That's how is, you know it's a good paper. It's got to be a good paper. Yeah. But interestingly, when I went to go read it, it's a bit, it's a difficult to wade through, but I can, I'll give it like a high level overview. So you talked about cloning yourself. And that's essentially the concept behind what this, what the authors did. And they um, studied computer scientists coming out of all 200 and some odd departments in the U.S. and Canada. And they had all of their numbers of papers they published and their number of citations. So productivity was defined as number of papers. And they looked at them on an annual basis and their prominence was number of citations, and again, looked at on an annual basis. And essentially, they identified people who were matched on a variety of sort of inherent characteristics, but on kind of the prestige of their training, as well as other features of, you know, their postdoctoral and graduate student training, who went to different institutions with different levels of prestige to see what happened in the five years after they accepted, you know, took on this faculty position to their productivity and their prominence measured in citations. And then they also had people who had different training backgrounds, but who ended up at the same, you know, level of prestige of an institution for their faculty position. And what they found is encapsulated in figure two, if anyone will include the link to the paper. But essentially, um, if you came from, if we cloned Roger when he just finished his postdoc and we sent one clone to super prestigious place and another clone to a less prestigious paper uh, place, what this paper suggests, although this is population level data, but that you, Roger, would be... Um, substantially more productive in terms of number of publications, the Roger that went to the higher prestige institution. And 
you, you would also have more citations. They do argue that um, the citation advantage of being at a more prestigious institution, they try to argue that, you know, it's, it's a small, relatively speaking. Actually, I'm sorry, that they argue that it's small, um, that environment, for environment, the prominence effect and the citation effect, the, pro- the productivity effect and the prominence effects are quite large, that there is an effect of your past training experience on citations or prominence, but that that effect is relatively small compared to the effect of environment on your citations or, or prominence. And, there, and there's no effect of your past experience and profile in terms of your productivity or number of publications. Right. So you're the, the prestige, <laughs> prestigiousness, is that a word? Uh, <laughs> the prestige, prestige. Yes. The prestige of your training does not ha- appear to have any effect on your productivity. Uh, so if you say prestigiousness, are you supposed to say prestige? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Never mind. No, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> They did try to, they looked at other things because part part of this is, you know, an institution, even given trying to match people on their graduate student or postdoc experience and how productive they were and the prestige of their program they went to, you could still argue that institutions were just better at sussing out who was going to be more productive. And they they do try to address this, but, you know, it's... It's an example of residual, like unmeasured confounding that you're you're not going to be able to address everything. Right. Do you have anything else to add? No, I don't think so. I think, well, one thing that's would be worth, I feel like the the figure that they show in terms of like, you know, over time, what's the difference in, say, publications or citations between a person who had, like, say, who worked at a prestigious uh, university versus someone who didn't. it, it, it like increases over time, so actually, right. So it's not like it's constant. It's not like every year that goes by, the the person at the at the prestigious university has you know two more publications or whatever. It's like every year there's actually more. The difference gets wider, right? Um, and so um, so it's not like a shift. It's more like a I don't know what the word is. <laughs> it's, it's like you know. So if you took the cumulative difference between you know, over time, it, you know the, the the difference between the two diff- the two identical clones. Uh, would we get really big, you know, over say ten years? Yes, if it continues along that path. Well, yeah, I guess we don't really know, but yeah, to extrapolate out. Uh, then there are limitations, in addition to the ones we discussed, like how they define prominence as a number of citations. You could argue about how you actually measure "quote unquote" success and those sorts of things. I think it raises an interesting point that confirms my belief. So I'm happy with the paper. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Should we revisit travel? Why not? One thing that's always like puzzled me, and I think I tend to be kind of an, an outlier in some, in some aspects of academia, which is what is up with people who are like constantly traveling? Okay. So I have, I have a little sympathy for those people. Maybe sympathy is not the right word. I have a potential explanation. Okay. I guess. So one of the things that happens to me every year is that I, for as long as I can, well, for quite a while now, I've I always taught in the fall, and I don't teach in the well in the fall semester, so to speak, and then I don't teach in the spring semester, right? So I never really, if if someone, if I get invitation to travel somewhere, I never do it in the fall. Because I'm teaching, and you know it's hard to get away when you've got classes right. all the time. I see a natural experiment, quote unquote, coming on. Okay, well, we'll get back to that. Okay. Um, so, what happens then is I say, okay, I can't do it in the fall, but how about in the spring, <laughs> right? <laughs> because in my mind, the spring semester is like this infinite bucket of time. <laughs> says the right? per- says the person who talks about the time pie. Right. So, and then like January rolls around. And I'm like, when did I agree to do all this travel? And then it's, and then I'm like going somewhere, you know, every other week or every week practically for the whole entire spring semester. So like this week, I actually took my very last trip <laughs> until basically October. But before then, it was a constant kind of, you know, 
travel you know schedule so i didn't mean for that to happen and i didn't even want it to happen but it happened <laughs> i i can see how that could happen but there are there are people who travel like that year round uh yeah i can see that yeah because for example if you don't do any teaching <laughs> or like if you teach on tuesdays and thursdays yeah i mean yeah occasionally i do travel in the fall but i try to right, avoid right it. The point is that when you think you've got time, you, you know your your conceptualization of time is that wow, it's infinite, right? <laughs> yeah, and I guess I was getting in another question, which was so there's the do you have time to do it, and so how do you for travel that you given that you're going to say yes, where do you fit the travel in? I'm curious about the upstream question, which is how do how, how is it that some people get to yes so that they're traveling multiple times a month routinely? Yeah, that's a good question. And that I mean, I can see it to like certainly I've had times where the same thing has happened to me, where suddenly, you know, I realize that I have you know three trips. They're short or whatever, but in a month. And I'm like, what the heck was I thinking? <laughs> right. But um, I wonder whether the question isn't like about how to manage the time related to them. I think there's a question of like, is this really – for every single invitation, is this really important for me to go to? Ah, yes. The ultimate question. What is the cost benefit? And so for me, I look at people that are traveling that much – and to me, it looks like there's like a huge cost with not necessarily very much benefit. Uh, yeah. So how do you answer this question? I don't know. I, I mean, I think it's because, well, maybe a little bit of history about my travel habits might be helpful. So when I started my fellowship, um, I had a one-year-old and a three-year-old. And I... And my husband at that time was doing an oncology fellowship. So he, it was pretty, he, it was not just that it was a ton of time that was required. There wasn't really any flexibility and it was time off site, like where he had to be in the hospital or in the clinic. So it was not, and we were fellows. So we had, didn't have like huge incomes so it wasn't necessarily – we didn't have family that lived in Baltimore. So it wasn't so easy for um, either one of us to travel, but in particularly more me because of all the clinical requirements of his training. Um, and so I made this decision, and it's interesting how this sort of got passed on. So there are two main allergy professional society meetings each year, and I would I went to one of them, but – didn't ever go to the other one. And I said, well, I'll go to one trip every year. It'll be the one that I think is most important for my career. And um, other fellows before I did my fellowship went to both meetings every year. And so I was the first fellow who just started going to one. And there was sort of like a, there was no overlap between me and the previous fellows. And so then the fellows who came along after me just started going to that one meeting <laughs> But that's you set the trend. I set the trend, but that's an aside, which I find just hilarious how that because it had nothing to do anyway. It was just all about how I wanted to manage my time and my family and considerations about my husband's career. And so, and it wasn't that I mean, I loved going to the meeting, I loved the career aspects of it, I liked you know, me, meeting people and interacting with people in my field that weren't at my same institution. I really loved having my own hotel room at a time when my kids were one and three because I could yeah. go there and like sh shut the door and know that I was, you know, had guaranteed kind of free time, like uninterrupted time. So it wasn't that I didn't enjoy the travel, but it, it turned out that, um, and this probably had to do with my environment too. It didn't hurt me one bit to not go to the other meeting. I mean, I guess you can't know that for sure, but... Well, we need your identical twin. We need, but I've been very happy with the path of my career having made that decision. And so I'm someone who has never, you know, I've heard some people give advice saying every time you're invited to go someplace, you need to say yes, particularly early in your career. 
And I've just not been that kind of person. And so I've continued now, like I finished my fellowship. Oh, wow. You know, almost uh, in 2003. And <laughs> could, could even calculate I couldn't even back, calculate right? that far back. And I still, it's not that I don't travel. I, I certainly travel, but I still don't understand. And you see it on Twitter, like every two weeks, there's like, you could predict who the people are who are like, oh, I'm now at this niche meeting about, you know, allergens and dust. You know, I'm at this other meeting about specifically about indoor gaseous pollutants. And then they're at the big meeting and then, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, And I, I'm just perplexed. That's all that I was trying to get at. And I was reminded of this because I had a lot of travel in April and I haven't had any travel since then. And I feel like during the time when I wasn't traveling, I like I'm more likely to have a full weekend to kind of decompress and catch up a little bit on work. And I'm just much, I'm less stressed when I'm not traveling that much. Okay. Anyway, that's my, so I just, I don't get it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, are you like asking me to explain it now? Yes. (laughs) Uh, I don't have any explanations, but there are a couple points here that I want to make. One is that I think in some sense we're talking about optimizing travel in a way, right? Because because uh, we're not saying don't ever travel, right? Right. The question is, well, how can you how can you you know select where you travel to kind of maximize some metric of I don't know what, right? <laughs> it's a risk benefit satisfaction, you know, and I think that to me is very hard to do. Because uh, it requires you to essentially evaluate what every opportunity that comes through and determine whether it's going to be a valuable, you know, experience or not. And it, I have found we were talking about this earlier. I have found that every I almost have a perfect uh, what's the word? Uh, I have a perfect predictor of of like the opposite of what I think is. Gonna, <laughs> I don't know what's that called. It's like basically if I think a meeting is going to be productive, like really productive and valuable, then the opposite happens. Well, so you at, therefore you have a perfect prediction model. I have a perfect prediction. I just need to. I I personally need to do the opposite of what I tell myself to do. <laughs> is what it comes <laughs> down to. <laughs> um, every time I think this meeting is going to be a waste of time, but I have to go for whatever reason. Uh, it, it like almost well, I wouldn't say always. It often turns out to be actually, you know, uh, you know, it's good that I went because I talked to so and so and blah blah blah, you know. And meetings that like have a great title and I think are going to be super interesting, it often is a bust. And um, can't quite figure out what the predictors are there. I have to think about it a little bit harder. I think. So anyway, so my ability to kind of optimize travel. It, is is basically zero because I would have to do the opposite of what I think I should do, <laughs> and that just doesn't happen. Well, you could you could start doing that. It's it's, it's easier said than done. Yes, I think. Yeah. Well, and there are other things that we haven't talked about, which is when you know someone who you know fairly well invites you to come give a talk or something. Right. That it can be hard to say no to that. You you could though, and I think I brought this up. Did I bring this up on the podcast or just when we were talking about? I wonder whether if you sort of created, you know, some parameters where you said, I'm not going to travel for work more than once a month. So when you get and you put in the fixed meetings that you go to every year, and then you have whatever calendars left, right? And when you get invited to do something, if it's not movable and it lands in a certain month, then you don't go. And if there's schedule flexibility, you can offer you know, to come another month. I would say that's one possibility. Um, but the question is, who enforces the rule? You yourself have to enforce it. Alas, yes. <laughs> You're not able to enforce it. I have another suggestion, actually. Okay. It, it, it's not as easy to execute, perhaps, but it, it works way better for me, which is to have a ready list of names <laughs> of people who could do the thing for you, in, you know, in some sense. Right. Um, so for often, you know, for like if I get invited, if I get invited to like an environmental kind of thing, um, you know, I have like former students who are faculty elsewhere 
and uh, you know, I can say, oh, well, you know, so and so would be a better person for this, you know, to give this talk or whatever. Um, and that is super easy to do. And and often the people inviting you, they don't really care. <laughs> well, and you. <laughs> and you're also like advocating for your. And, yeah, it's yeah. like a triple win yes. basically. Um, and so, but you have to kind of have those names at the ready because like when the email comes in and you have to like sit there and think about like another person, often that's like more work than just saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> so have a list of names ready to go for like, I don't know, for whatever topics you might get invited to like, you know, deal with. So you have, bi- you have, you have binders of environmental biostatisticians. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say binders. I'd say like, you know, a short, a post-it note. A post-it basically. note. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is for me the easiest thing to do. Uh, I don't have like a million students that, you know, you know, so I have, so it's not like a super long list. Some other people, you know, they have so many students that they've graduated that, you know, it's a long list, but, um, so that's kind of like how, so I think that's like a good way to deal with it because yeah, it does like benefit someone else and, you know, and it solves your problem at the same time. Right. But I think, um, the other thing I wanted to mention, which is, I forgot a second ago, um, is that, you know, I think I, I think I might've told the story before, but like, you know, when I was this, an assistant professor, we had these meetings at the school that was like, just, just for the assistant professors. And they were kind of like, uh, professional development type meetings. And, um, I remember the vice dean, uh, one of the vice deans of the school for research, I think, you know, she, she talked about how, like when she was a junior faculty, she just didn't travel <laughs> like period. She didn't want to do it. She didn't enjoy it. So she didn't do it. Um, and, uh, and you know, she it turned out fine. And I think her point is I mean her point was basically if you don't want to do it, then don't do it, right? Um and her point was that yes, there are benefits that you get from travel, uh, but there's also benefits you get from not traveling, right? And um and it, and if you're if you're only kind of if your long term outcome is to like, you know, be promoted and to be on the faculty, then there's kind of many different paths to get there. So Yeah. And maybe th- maybe that's freeing to hear that from her. It was, it had it did have a big influence on me because I think I was of the mindset that was essentially like well you gotta you know you gotta travel you gotta network you gotta meet people and things like that and just so just to hear her say that was uh, it was very influential. The only other thing I was going to add about travel before we I think probably before we wrap up or not this is just a kind of comment that I have seen a trace of academic Twitter activity about the climate change effects of travel. Oh, all that flying back and forth. Yep. So maybe, you know, maybe the, maybe the pendulum will swing to less travel in the future. All that being said, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that kind of argument. Um, but, but just I feel like the, our, our conversation here kind of came off as like anti-travel. Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. There's something to be said about uh, meeting various pe- meeting people in person. Um, there's just an, there's just a, I don't know, often there's a conversation that happens that it would never otherwise happen. Um, and, uh, and, you know, ideas get passed back and forth and, and often many times when I come back from me, actually, we were just having this conversation before we recorded it about, yeah, you know, I came back from a meeting and, you know, had a couple ideas for either papers or commentaries or whatever. And I, you know, I think, and I actually had not a controlled experiment, but an experiment of sorts in the sense that this meeting that I w- recently went to happens every year. And, you know, the one of the years there was, I can't remember what the issue was, but we couldn't do it in person. So we did it online. Uh, and it's a big meeting. There's lots of people, you know, and, and, you know, it's, I think it's, it's not like a stretch to say that's different. It's a different experience. Right. Um, and uh, you don't walk away with the same kind of uh, ideas. I think then if you meet people in person, because there's a lot of stuff that happens at lunch and, uh, you know, in the hallways and, uh, just in between things, things like at, at coffee, whatever, things like that. So, all right, that's a good point. Yeah, we're not bashing travel. We're just saying you shouldn't feel like this angst that you need to do a lot of it. Yeah, I think like everything, it's a trade off, right. and um, and a little bit of it is good. And I, it probably the, the kind of the dose response of terms of benefit flattens out, you know, pretty quickly. I think. Should we move on to weekly grind? Sure. I. I presented to a data safety monitoring board. Oh, really? Is this for a clinical trial? Yes. No, 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 no. That because that's done. It was. It's for uh, the mobility study. Oh, okay. Okay. That's it. And uh, it went okay. Yeah. 
was I implicated in any way? Oh, you were actually. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> yes, there was some discussion about like a post hoc power calculation. Okay, keep ca- me out of it. That came up. <laughs> oh no, I dragged your name into it. <laughs> well, we've discussed this with our biostatistician and so on and so forth. My weekly grind is is hot off the presses, actually. Really, um, it's like because it concerns what I was doing this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I am trying to write a paper, and uh, it's still hard to write a paper. I don't know; has it gotten any easier in sixteen years? It is hard to write a paper. Yeah. What and why are you writing a paper? Because who else is going to write it? That's <laughs> <laughs> what it comes down to. This paper. It's uh, it's still brewing in my head, as I guess is what it comes down to. Is it? I mean, it's not based on primary data of some sort. What do you mean? <laughs> well, if like like there's data that's been collected and you've analyzed it, you kind of yes know what the paper should look like. It doesn't make it easy, but I'm trying to figure out whether the paper that you're writing is more of like a theoretical paper, and oh. you still haven't gotten all of the theory straight in your mind. No, no, no. All the work is done except for writing the paper part. Okay. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's often where I get stuck for a little, for a little uh-huh. while. That's why I'm like recording podcasts now, you know. Anything. Procrastination. Yeah. Anyway. No, I think the hard part, just for to be serious for just one moment, um, you know, it's crafting the story, right? Um, and I can't quite... I can't, yeah, you got to... Just like any good story, you got to hit your beats, you know? And... Uh, I just can't quite figure out what the beats of the story are yet. So, well, maybe you can give us an update next week. Or two oh, yeah. weeks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. I'll, I'll have the paper done. That's by right. Then, yeah. Well, I've written the first paragraph of the introduction. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's a wrap. Yep. So you can email us, and our email address is theeffortreport at gmail dot com, and you can also find us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is the at the effort report. Thanks everybody for listening. <laughs>